Good afternoon and welcome to Asia Society Australia and today's China Executive Briefing, Chinese Investment, Where To From Here. I'm James Scullin, Program Director at Asia Society Australia, coming to you from our new offices at the Asia Trade and Innovation Hub at RMIT University on Swanson Street here in rainy Melbourne. Before we begin, Asia Society acknowledges that many participants in today's event are dialing in from locations that have traditional owners and custodians. Today I'm speaking to you from the Bun Rural and Wurundjeri lands of the East Kulin Nation, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. As always, thank you to the National Foundation for Australia-China Relations for supporting our China Executive Briefing series. Thank you also to Asia Society Australia member Minta Allison for co-hosting today's program and their active support of what we do. I'd also like to thank our project partners, China Policy, who prepared our most recent policy brief on China's outward and inbound investment flows. The brief outlines China's global trends in both overseas and foreign direct investment, ambitions for a greener Belt and Road and digital Silk Road, as well as China's 14th five-year plan on foreign direct investment. The brief is a great overview of China's overall investment outlook around Beijing's current domestic and global policy settings. If you've not yet read the brief, you can click on the link you'll find in the chat box below your screen now. Building on from the brief, on today's program, we'll be looking at China's outward investment from an Australian perspective. Despite the current frosty nature of the bilateral relationship, our panel will today evaluate the prospects for Chinese investment in Australia going forward. As noted in the most recent KPMG and University of Sydney demystifying Chinese investment in Australia report, the value of annual Chinese investment into Australia declined by almost 70% from US dollar 1.9 billion in 2020 to US dollar 0.6 billion in the 2021 calendar year. This comes from a peak of 19.1 billion back in 2008. While I'm sure attendees are well aware of the recent challenges across the bilateral relationship, as well as the impact of the pandemic and tighter investment screening in Australia, today we'll be looking to better understand China's global investment flows and policy settings and what sectors and industries hold the best prospects for Chinese investment into Australia in the years ahead. As always, to help us dive in and analyse today's China Executive Briefing, we have our expert panel. Hans Hendrischke is Professor of Chinese Business and Management at the University of Sydney. Hans leads the Business School's China Research Network and chairs the Business and Economics Cluster of the University's China Studies Centre. Hans's main research interests are the emergence of China's private enterprise sector and more recently the global expansion of Chinese enterprise activity, including their investment in Australia and the wider region. Hans is also one of the key architects of the Demystifying Chinese Investment in Australia report, now in its 15th year. Amanda Rasmussen is the General Manager for FTR Consulting in Hong Kong, a market-leading business advisory firm. Amanda's particular expertise is in-depth business intelligence into the structure, financial positions, political connections, assets, and risks associated with high-profile Chinese multinationals, and the backgrounds, reputations, and sources of wealth of high net worth individuals across the Asia Pacific region. And finally, Bryn Davis is a merger and acquisition transaction specialist and partner at multinational law firm Minta Ellis. Bryn's expertise spans buy and sell side transactions for public and private clients, particularly in the energy and resources, agribusiness, and technology sectors, with a particular focus on inbound investment. Bryn has helped public, private and listed entities navigate the complexities of Australian corporate law, foreign investment regimes and other key regulatory risks. For attendees, throughout our panel discussion today, please feel free to, to submit any brief questions or comments in the Q&A box below your screen. As always, there's a lot to cover, but our panel will endeavour to incorporate any comments or questions into today's conversation, so please let us know your thoughts throughout the session. Well, without any further ado, let's move on to our discussion. Um, Hans, my first question um, is for you. Uh, what would you say the current state of play is when we look at Chinese outward direct investment into Australia? 
We know the bilateral relationship has been difficult of late, um, but I was wondering if you could shed any light on any particular global or structural reasons that may have impacted um, the drop in Chinese investment into Australia. Thank you, James. I'm happy to do that. And what I what I really would like to do, first of all, is to put things into context, because the way in which Australia relates to China, the whole question of foreign direct investment is not so much a bilateral matter. Uh, we are embedded in a multilateral context where we are in many areas only a small player. Um, I think I had a slide, James, if we could bring that up, that might help to show where we come from, and I will use that also to show where other countries sit in comparison to us. This is the graph we did for our last year's report on investment in 2021, and we put together the figures from 2007 to last year. Uh, this is several stories, and, and, and I think that's important to to see because I will I will fit in where other countries are. What it tells us in the first place is that up to 2012, 2013, we had mining investment. That's the big mining investment 2008. Um, and that was largely iron or coal mining, some energy where China came in. Um, at that time, in a situation we needed to secure resources. So Australia was one of the the first partners and the most promising partners. And in fact, the Mount Shanaha iron ore mine was the first big investment that China took overseas. So we we really did play a role uh, in that period. And we were for roughly a decade, the largest recipient country of Chinese direct investment, larger than any of the other countries. That only started to change around 2012, 2013, um, at a time when the mining investment boom started to ebb off, largely because capacities had been reached and there was less need and less demand for big investment. What China did in that second period was to reorient, to move away from the mining investment. And that had a number of impacts. That mean, meant moving away from the reliance on very large projects reliance on big state-owned corporations and moving closer to the market. So we started to have investment in renewable investment in agriculture. Essentially, the Chinese were trying to sort and find a place in the Australian economy and put the Australian inputs into their economy. And that lasted roughly to 2016, 2017. The, the basis at that period was real estate investment, commercial real estate, not residential, but commercial real estate that held, uh, well, that provided the plateau on which Chinese investment came in. And on top of that, you had different types of company, different sizes, so a general diversification. And also, and I think that's very important for our perspective now, what happened in that second period was that Chinese investors started to settle in into the Australian context. They started to learn. They started to operate with Australian partners. You had Chinese banks coming in, integrating in the Australian economy. And from 2016, 2017, uh, that was the time when trouble started with the United States. We have then this fairly steep decline and drop of investment. If I was going to overlay over our chart here, the figures for the United States and for Europe, what we would see is a similar shape. We would just have a much more pronounced rise in 2016 and 2017, simply because there were huge projects coming in. That was the uh, entertainment projects in the U.S., uh, with uh, Dalian Wanda, and in Europe it was a Syngenta with Switzerland, the seeds and uh, biotechnology company that was acquired by the Chinese. They pushed the level up, and so we have on their side a steeper decline for this third period, which was essentially a period of bringing things down. I think where we want to go in terms of economic uh, 
cooperation and economic integration as much as that is desired is probably going back to the second period because that's when everything happened uh, and try to resolve the issues that came up in the third period because in the third period we had the Foreign Investment Review Board changing their policies, uh, introducing new screening mechanisms, multilateralizing screening mechanisms with uh, allies and partners. So we have a whole range of, of bureaucratic changes that came in in those last years. And many of those are technical issues that in the end we will have to resolve if we want to come back to a more level playing field where we we are on a on a commercial rather than on a political basis. I think that's that's the background probably from which it was we we, we would start our consideration where we are and where we want to go. Mm. Oh, well, thank you very much for that um, macro overview, Hans. That's an excellent way to, to start our discussion off today. Um, Bryn, I might come to you now um, and ask from your perspective dealing with Chinese clients at, at Minta Allison, Chinese clients looking to invest in Australia. Um, I was just wondering what you could tell us about what you're hearing from Chinese investors in Australia and, and, and the current sentiment towards Australia uh, as an investment destination. Thanks, James. Um, well, I think that it's it's an interesting question, and there's a few different elements to it, depending on the nature of the uh, particular client and the and the kind of investment that they they might be um, interested in making. But to touch on and and reiterate some of the points that that Hans um, very uh, made very well, there's an obvious decline in in initial inbound investment into Australia, and that's that's borne out in the in the data which shared with us and and the the foreign investment screening regime is certainly something that our clients are, are, are more nervous about and are, are taking uh, a more cautious approach to and so I think for, for for many Chinese companies or clients that might be looking at making an initial investment whether in Australia or in another jurisdiction, they will be they will be looking at that as one of the factors that they'll need to take into consideration into choosing the destination for the, for their capital, and so I think that um some of the high profile rejections of investments that have happened over the last few years um, do weigh on the minds of of investors from China. That's not to say that <clears throat> the the foreign investment screening regime in Australia um, is rejecting a lot of investments. It's a very rare thing for investments to be rejected. And the Australian uh, Treasury has been very clear in their rhetoric that they're seeking to find ways to facilitate investment um, instead of instead of blocking investment. Um, but that that is still um, something that is at the front of front of the minds of many people from China who are looking at making investments. Um, particularly in some of those more sensitive sectors. So so where, where an investment may involve something like critical minerals, that's, that's something where, where an investor from China you know, would weigh up Australia as one potential destination for capital versus, versus a, another jurisdiction. Um, but I think you can break it down even further. So I think you can, you can break it down to you know, the, the type of investor. Um, Hans also touched on um, the state-owned enterprises and the, and the nature of the investment that they're making. We've certainly seen the numbers and the, and the, and the scale of investment by SOEs drop off, and, and certainly the, the foreign investment screening may be, may be part of that as well. Um, and the, only, the, the other point that I think is important is that many investors from China actually have a substantial uh, amount of assets and projects in Australia. And so... Um, while it might not be the case that um, um, you know it, it, immediate uh, influxes of deals into the into Australia are are showing here that there's a there's certainly a large amount of investment that is requiring management. There's a large amount of commerce that is being undertaken, and and investors from from China are finding new and um, sophisticated ways to to finance their projects. Um, to partner with Australian companies and to um, 
you know, uh, make successful investments in Australia or make the investments that they've made into Australia successful through slightly more sophisticated means of financing them rather than just just necessarily pumping money in. So, so I think that those are those are some of the ways that um, the the difficulties in the in the bilateral relationship are, are, are showing at, at the practical level. Mm. Excellent. Um, well, thank you for that, Bryn. Um, yeah, particularly interesting around that that drop off on on SOE investment compared to to private firms. Um, so we've got a macro overview. Um, we've had a look at um, the domestic um, perspective in Australia. Um, now to Hong Kong and Amanda, um, and from your vantage point in market in Hong Kong, um, what's the view been like on the ground with regard to how the pandemic? Um, has impacted overseas um, investment prospects. Um, to what extent has China's zero COVID policy and border restrictions um, left its mark on China's broader investment flows? Yeah, and obviously the, in, any answer to that question is going to be the one that, you ex, that we all expect, which is that, yes, of course, it's had a, a major impact. I think in the 2020 period, in the early stages of COVID, the zero COVID policy was perceived as an advantage for China. And as um, the rest of the world has opened up, that has clearly become a disadvantage. Um, just speaking to Chinese clients um, on in the mainland and speaking to my colleagues who, who engage regularly with Chinese clients, I think the general mood is um, some frustration, um, but um, uh, CEOs specialise in a kind of a certain kind of patience, I think, when it, when it comes to government policies and procedures. And, and certainly the large companies that we support have been able to send their CEOs out overseas regularly throughout the pandemic and feel like they've been able to keep in touch sufficiently with their overseas investments to keep those investments going. And uh, there is ongoing interest in, in further investments and they're in those spaces that we would usually expect in infrastructure along the um, Belt and Road initiative areas where um, China can advantage South-South global cooperation um, in Africa um, and um, in particular, we've been looking at um, renewable energy, you know, everywhere from Brazil through to Southeast Asia. Um, and, of course, Africa is a major area of interest for, for China and continues to be. Thanks for that, um, Amanda. Um, and Hans, just continuing with that, that global perspective, um, what are we seeing globally with regards to Chinese outbound investment comparatively? Um, how have other countries fared in attracting Chinese investment in recent years? And if investors are considering Australia less, are there other markets that are attracting their attention? That's a, that's a very interesting question. And I think, again, there's, a, there's an underlying point to make, um, and that is that, of course, the restriction of Chinese outbound investment is not something that happened purely on our side or the side of developing countries or recipient countries. But from 2016 onwards, China started to put into place currency restrictions and currency control measures to reduce their outbound investment. There was a period around 2016 before of, of near euphoria by Chinese investors, big companies being able to go out to buy prestige assets, uh, things that are possibly highly speculative. Uh, and on the on in Chinese terminologies, they were then called irrational investment. Uh, and there were restrictions put in place. But these are the two restrictions that the Chinese put in place in the first instance. Uh, currency control, so companies that did not have um, currency reserves on their own, for example, uh, I think they're large Chinese multinationals running overseas operations. They might have their own currency reserves they could use to invest in Australia, but companies that have to go through the Chinese currency exchange system, they would need approval and they would have to go through the whole Chinese bureaucracy and sometimes answer very detailed and very intrusive questions on why certain projects should be approved or why they are, in fact, in the end, likely to be profitable. All of that is something that companies have to do only since 
those restrictions came in place. So that is one big reason why uh, investment is has re- has gone down and has been reduced. Um, another point, of course, is the the global political sa- situation. And again, that's before we come to Australia. Uh, that is the way in which uh, the US are putting pressure on China, the way in which the US are putting pressure on US firms investing in China. doesn't mean that they can't invest. They are increasing investment, many of them. But on the other side, there are also companies that have to listen to political pressure or to reduce their exposure to China because they are trying to get subsidies, for example, in the whole technological decoupling process. Uh, that is one consideration that U.S. firms have to keep in mind. And then the the the, the way in which the U.S. is is redefining what is tolerable and what is acceptable in trade and technology trade, specifically with China. That has an impact on on the UK, on European countries. Started in Europe with the UK, the other European countries have step by step followed on that and have introduced regulation. Europe is a complicated issue altogether because uh, you might have a difference between what the government says and what the companies do, um, which, which has an old, a long tradition in Europe. Uh, but overall, of course, it has an impact on Chinese investment flowing out, similar with Japan and other countries. So that's one big um, sphere where there is restrictions on China in a, in a global sense. Um, the other question you had is a very interesting one. Um, that's the question, to what extent do Chinese investors go to other countries? Um, depends very much on what you are looking at. For example, if it's a question of resources take off, then, of course, Chinese iron ore buyer would try to go to Africa or to Latin America or for coal, again, to, to other countries where they find markets. But Australia was not in a situation where it was only really there for takeoff. That was part of that second period of of growth and interaction was that Chinese companies started to use Australia as a market to learn operating in foreign markets. So they would have, in the end, where they wanted to be was the US or the UK or Europe. But before getting there, it was a very good intermediate stage to settle down in Australia learn how to deal with a culturally different environment, highly legalized environment. Even learning to work with FERB, with the Foreign Investment Review Board, was a learning process that uh, companies appreciated as much as they probably did not appreciate it, whatever was felt to be too intrusive from the government side. But uh, Australia is a it was in a special situation, so it was not something that you could easily replace. Uh, it's something where probably companies are still waiting now to come back uh, and rebuild those capabilities that they uh, were acquiring at that time. You had, for example, Chinese companies that were starting to build their international headquarters in 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 Australia. So instead of running an operation or their international operation, including those in in the UK or Europe, from Beijing or Shanghai or wherever in China, uh, they set up organizations to do that from the Australian context because that was easier to run it from here. And that's something that probably has gone missing in this whole process. Uh, but it's likely to, something that, to, to be something that will come back eventually. Yeah, fascinating, Hans. Thanks for that. Um, now, I see someone raise their hand. Um, Please, if you could just um, direct all your questions to the Q&A box um, below your screen, um, we'll, we'll get to those attendee questions throughout the chat. Um, now, I'd just like to um, jump back to um, Australia, just with that um, great perspective that Hans has given us around Chinese ODI flows. Um, Bryn, coming back to Australia and, and given the drop in Chinese investment in recent years, um, are we now seeing more diverse, diversified sources of capital from, from other countries um, plug some of those holes that are left with um, the, from the drop in uh, Chinese investment? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so, you know, there, there might be a concern that, you know, with a, with a drop in that uh, foreign direct investment from China, is there suddenly a gaping hole left in 
um, inbound investment to Australia. Um, global M&A and, and M&A in Australia has actually been quite quite strong <laughs> recently, which was something that perhaps surprised a few people um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, I think 2021 was actually a very strong year for Australia. And what we saw is that, you know, the mix of, the mix of that investment did change a bit. There was um, a fair bit more investment from the US, from uh, Canada, the UK, uh, Japan, and, and, and South Korea, who seem to be sort of, um, uh, you know, picking up on some of those, those opportunities to acquire assets, um, uh, notwithstanding that, that the, the, the ODI investment from China had dropped off. So it was, it was, it was quite positive then that there was a, you know, a, a, a number of, a number of um, other jurisdictions that were seeing opportunities to invest in Australia. Um, that said, you know, there are, there are currently still some headwinds for, for global M&A and deal making. The geopolitical position obviously throws some uncertainty in there. Um, inflation and interest rates as well create some some uncertainty and headwinds. So um, I think we'll have to see where the, re- where the remainder of 2022 leaves us. But certainly, 2021 was was um, was an encouraging year. Um, and, and just to follow up, Bryn, on the on the on the domestic landscape, um, I'm, I'm mindful we've only been talking about investment thus far. Um, but I was wondering what you could share around the the relationship between investment and, and exports. And, and given there's been a drop in Chinese investment into Australia, um, have we seen that affect our our exports um, that are typically destined for China? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, so, so as a lawyer, that's um, that, and, and not an economist um, to, to to give you a perfect you know explanation of the relationship between those two is going to be complicated, and I may not be the best person to um to to do that. But what I would say is that uh, the nature of um, Australia's exports to China are very heavily related to resources. Iron ore has been a um, uh, you know, a massive part of that, and historically coal, though coal had a, a number of shocks to the um, to, to to exports to to China, and and so that's had to filter through that that system and and find different markets around the world. Um, but certainly, there's still a lot of exporting going on to China, notwithstanding some of the um, the, the tariffs and, and and trade restrictions there. Um, and I think that part of the reason for that is that a lot of the investment that China has made in Australia through the first wave and the second wave of, um, of that Chinese investment was really focused on the, the mining, the mining and resources piece and the, the export tail that comes from those investments lasts many, many years. So the fact that um, there might be a drop off in investment at the moment isn't really impacting the, the export piece of it. Where these large operating assets are still, uh, you know, creating offtake, and um, and and many of these investments were structured specifically and designed and structured specifically to to facilitate the export of of this product to China, and so you know, going back to two thousand and seven, there would be there would be um, a range of investments and projects that would be, you know, uh, feeding that continued strong export to China. And it's still a very critical market for Australia. Mm. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Bryn. Um, Amanda, coming back to you now. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful we've predominantly been discussing ODI, which is Overseas Direct Investment from China into Australia. Um, if we can just briefly touch on foreign direct investment into China, so which is F, the FDI. Um, I just wanted to know how you're seeing things from Hong Kong, um, which is China's largest source of FDI, um, and, and what you can tell us about China's current policy settings and priority industries um, with regard to attracting FDI um, into China um, from other countries. Sure, absolutely. Um, I think, as we all know, much of that very, very large amount of investment um, going into China from Hong Kong is actually from a range of different sources uh, around the world, but also um, particularly, and some experts claim, up to 50% actually comes from China itself um, and in order to take advantage of certain 
um, tax and regulatory advantages. Um, and But overall, what we see is investment into China in exactly the areas that we would expect um, advanced manufacturing, high tech industries, uh, biosciences, logistics, e-commerce, um, uh, those th those kinds of areas, um, and we can continue to have continued to see that interest right throughout right throughout the pandemic. Um, most of our clients are not clients that that are coming, you know, directly from Australia, as, as um, Bryn has just said, most, um, a lot of the Australia-China relationship is built on exports um, and on mining and minerals, um, and obviously on hospitality and tourism um, and education services. Um, in terms of services and professional services, I think there's a lot of interest from um, China and particularly the Shanghai Free Trade Zone to encourage um, more, of interest from financial services and so companies like JP Morgan and BlackRock and, um, and other you know big financial services companies are very very interested in the opportunities that China offers um, with regard to allowing 50% ownership of, of their of their companies um, and so there'll be a lot of encouraging you know they're China's keen to see what kinds of products insurance products and financial products those companies can offer and start to build a more mature um, retail market um, so and and those are obviously not areas that Australia necessarily can can immediate or has been interested in immediately jumping into but certainly an area that other international companies are are very are very keen on um, you mentioned the the Shanghai free trade zone um, would, would you say Australian companies are on par with um, their engagement with such initiatives in China compared to other sources of FDI um, from around the world? Or, or do you think, do you see Australia underperforming here in, in utilising um, initiatives like the Shanghai Free Trade Zone? Yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, you, I mean, I haven't, for obvious reasons, I haven't been into China myself for some, for some years. And certainly before, you know, before the pandemic, there's a real sense of Australia being very, very present in Shanghai and and, and in in all of the major cities in across China. Um, and I just don't know, you know, either from a statistical perspective or from a, just a personal anecdotal perspective, to what extent that that remains true. I'm conscious much more of the number of people and and companies that are talking about either restructuring their businesses within China or or key, key, key executives not being able to get to get in on the ground. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Amanda. Cheers. Um, Hans, back to you now. Um, what can you tell us about Beijing's latest um, signals to investors um, with regards to the sectors that they're encouraged or, or discouraged from investing in? Well, that, again, that, that is an interesting story uh, because that's the story that's being played at the moment and, and that will decide very much what is happening uh, possibly even in the near future. Uh, with how the, the the investment relationship is going between Australia and China, uh, the the I think to look at the discouraged and or encouraged um, investment targets, that is something that is is very much bureaucratic. So it comes from the from the bureaucracy side in the sense that uh, there are rules. What is what is easy to get approval? What fits into existing infrastructure? What exists what fits into existing institutional structures. Um, but companies, of course, will always find ways around. So there, there are long, long stories about uh, industries that were maybe not encouraged or partially encouraged. And after a while, because industries are dynamic, uh, people simply got around those those regulations. So I think the first point to, to say is this is a very dynamic environment. Um, and one point that, that Bryn made earlier with the sophistication of Chinese finance companies, for example, um, I think it's possible that our whole debate, not the whole debate, but part of our debate uh, about being hostile or not or being reluctant to work with China is somehow and gradually being overtaken by simply the sophistications uh, that Chinese finance companies have. They are international before they're Chinese. So you would talk to companies here where kind of only in the third sentence you figure out that is actually a Chinese company because they come and they're Canadian or something else and they are globally operating. So um, 
And I think that's something we have in the, in, certainly in the finance sector, but I think we'll have that increasingly also in the technology sector, uh, that our current ideas of protecting privacy or all of that are technical issues that in the end will be resolved before probably we have a, a political solution. But the, the, in a way, the political solutions then are coming behind the technical solutions. So the the environment, I think, is much more is much more flexible. Um, in terms of practical signals, uh, there is quite a lot happening at the moment. Um, we've looked at uh, investment that we can see so far for 2022 to come on board this year. And it seems there's going to be some increase. However, that increase looks very much like uh, projects being approved that relate more to, at the moment still, more to overseas Chinese interests that are held or held in Australia than to actual investment in Australia. So there's an opening, uh, but at the moment neither side is is giving too much away. But certainly they were. Uh, uh, the foreign investment review board was approached by Rio Tinto by other companies, and and it seems they will agree in the end. So. Uh, there are signals on that on that regulatory side that at least some deals go through. There are other much more practical signals, and that is the last one will be uh, a speech that the China, the new Chinese ambassador uh, gave a few days ago, where he made suggestions such as uh, Australia and China could work together on the manufacturing of electric cars or electric vehicles. These are things that would have been impossible to say and and to to get into the the press as something that's at least reasonably sensible to look at uh, a few months probably ago, or certainly a few years ago. So there are signals that are that are coming. Are they taken up? Um, not, not yet to the full degree that they they could be or might be further down the track. Uh, this morning uh, or today, the the ex ambassador Jeff Raby uh, has a op ed in the Financial Review where he he act part of being an ambassador. <laughs> he develops a, a, a whole series of steps that could be taken to get things back on track. We might not go down that way. That's a that's a, a complex political issue. But um, there there are points from his side and points from the political side, Chinese side as well, uh, where there is more openness than we've had before. So these signals are subtle, and the signals probably don't relate to specific deals that are under consideration. But they're more saying we could do things that we have not been doing before. And that is already an improvement over what we had until recently. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating, Hans. Yeah, I find that particularly interesting around, you know, the speeches from the new Chinese ambassador around electric vehicles and and the subtlety um, of of, of those particular signals. Um, Bryn, while while we're talking about those investment signals, is there anything you wanted to add from your client side? Um, Well, I mean, from the the client side, um, certainly finding ways to 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 do deals in in a manner that is consistent with you know the Australian national interest and the guidance from the foreign investment review board is always something that is you know a, a real positive step in terms of being able to navigate those things um, in terms of the 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 bilateral um, relationship um, I think Hans was quite quite right that there are subtle subtle signals there and and I think I think with the Australia the new Australian government coming in earlier this year there was sort of a um, you know uh, there was the possibility of trying to reset you know the, the the frostiness of the relationship that you mentioned in your introduction and and maybe a, a reset is too ambitious of a of a of an idea to necessarily um, think is going to be achieved in in a very short period of time, but there are there are small changes in tone, in terms of the the rhetoric that is used, and and uh, because because that because the tone of that the conversation is measured, and because it um, the the tone of the conversation and the and the sentiments seem to be related to cooperation, um, um, you know there are there are some positive signs there 
that there there's the possibility of you know that relationship improving. So I think that's that's actually quite positive. Mm. Excellent. Thank you for that, Bryn. Um, so just a reminder to attendees, um, if you have a question, um, please um, enter it in the Q&A box below um, the screen. Um, we, we, we probably have about 15 minutes to go. Um, Amanda, um, just looking at Beijing's strategic priorities again, and, and particularly strategic initiatives like Belt and Road and, and Greater Bay Area. Um, I was just wondering if you could shed some light into to what degree these um, strategic initiatives um, play into China's prioritization of um, outward investment flows. Yeah, for sure. Look, I think um, uh, an area like the Greater Bay Area has been set up precisely for that for that purpose. So to start to expand the island that is Hong Kong into a larger space that also includes the mainland is very much part of that process. And um, as, as you'll see in Australia, there's a lot of talk about it and there's a lot of talk here about it too. Um, you know, there's a lot of fintech activity, is a, a bit of biosciences activity in that space. And so Chinese companies that are interested in connecting with partners um, or with um, financing facilities, et cetera, can do that via the Greater Bay Area um, infrastructure in, increasingly, I, I, I expect. Um, and certainly, you know, Australian law firms and professional services firms are setting themselves up for that kind of offering that kind of advice. Um, the other area is the Hainan, the new Hainan free trade zone. Um, so there's a lot of interest in setting up um, uh, LVMH, Louis Vuitton and um, DFS, the, the, the big duty-free stores are all um, working towards moving across there to set up uh, their opportunities. And I, so I suppose to the extent that Chinese companies are partnering um, with those companies that and selling to those organise to those companies that will be important too. And otherwise, the you know, the main the, the global strategic priorities of China remain um, around um, you know building influence and the and in particular with the Belt and Road Initiative. And so any infrastructure investment, etc., that Chinese companies um, suggest might advance that cause will, of course, be um, We'll, we'll, we'll be working your way through the regulatory processes that Hans mentioned regarding um, internal regulatory processes that Hans mentioned um, will be much more straightforward if you if you if, if a Chinese company is tagging those key initiatives. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah, I did. I, I did want to ask Hans um, a, a little more about that whether. You know, if, if, if a Chinese investor is looking at um, outward direct investment, um, to what extent does tagging um, your investment to a strategic initiative like Belt and Road or Greater Bay Area assist you as an investor? Um, does that mean that if you can align your strategic investment with Belt and Road, Road. Um, does um, that allow greater financing from Chinese banks if you're able to kind of badge that investment with the strategic in, um, initiative? That's that's a question where I think you're, you're in the end, you'll end up with yes and no. Um, the answer is yes, under kind of all normal circumstances, that's what everybody tells you. Uh, that's what you hear when people are stuck with projects where we didn't get approval because. So there's a whole lot of reasons why that plays a role. Um, it becomes more differentiated when you look at what specific companies do and what type of com or types of companies do and do differently. You could have examples which we haven't talked to. Uh, State-owned companies, uh, we said we're far too big. We don't have to worry about any of that. We don't need Belt and Road. We do what we want. Um, and you might have private companies or smaller state-owned companies that are struggling to get funding, and they would try to to add belt and road or to add policies. But I think in, in general, you could say that these policies do give an incentive to companies, whether it's a direct financial incentive or whether it's a broader incentive or whether companies do that to be in the good books of their local government. Mm. Uh, all of these, it's a bundle of reasons that in the end work in favour of those. But it doesn't mean that if you don't do it, you're being in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's it very much comes down to a practical issue. 
from the policy side, it is good to kind of tie your uh, future to any of those policies. Looks good. For practical purposes, you might not have to. Mm. Great. Thank you, Hans. Um, a final shout out to any, any questions from attendees um, as, we, as we move towards the end of the session. Um, please drop your question um, into the Q&A box um, below your screen if you have any. Um, Bryn, I'd just like to um, move back to you um, and ask a bit of a hypothetical question um, around whether Australia-China Australia relations were to improve over the next few years. Um, and what we know about the current profile of the Chinese investor, what we know about those investment signals, um, what, what Australian sectors do you see holding the most promise um, in the eyes of Chinese future investment um, mm -hmm. into Australia, if you're able to kind of cast your yeah, eye? Absolutely. Um, well, I, Hans actually touched on one of them and, and the expansion of electric vehicles as a, as a, as a sector and, and the key piece of that being being the battery technology that um, that they rely on. Um, the critical mineral sector in Australia is obviously something that is fundamental to development of that industry. Australia is blessed, I think, to have actually a fairly um, uh, good repository of the you know cobalts, lithiums, and tantalums, and other kinds of minerals that are really required. Um, for that supply chain, um, so that's that's one area where I think that there is the possibility for genuine interest from China to invest in Australia because you know we're in a position where we actually have access to those rare earths. Um, perhaps one of the difficulties there is that that's one of the areas that is more closely screened and scrutinised by the um, Foreign Investment Review Board, and so I think that you know there's the possibility of of investment there. But it's it's something that would um, benefit from a you know a, a, a proactive and and diligent approach to to managing the um, foreign investment regime in Australia. Um, so that's one obvious one there. The other the other piece that I think touches on a few of the uh, different sectors that have been mentioned today is is probably renewables. So solar and wind farms and and energy generation in that renewable space. Um, China's a, a a world leader in photovoltaic technology. They they have fantastic technology in that sector, and Australia has a lot of sun and a lot of a lot of areas where um, PV cells can actually be deployed. Mm. Um, and so that's and, and it dovetails quite nicely between the policy objectives of the Australian government, as well as you know tapping into some of the great technology that that China has, um, and. I suppose from a from a foreign investment screening perspective, there are there are you know it's it's somewhat easier in 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 that space to um to make investments into that sector, and there's there's certain sort of um, technical rules under the FERB regime that actually make it a little bit easier for investment to occur there. Mm. So so I think that those it's certainly certainly in in my work as a as a resources and energy lawyer, those those are the two the two two areas that that are really um, good opportunities. I suppose the, the third one, and this is just something that I think we've touched on before, is that China owns a lot of assets in Australia that, um, that either are partly developed or could be developed um, into producing assets. And so um, investment into those and finding sophisticated ways to be able to manage and fund the development of those assets, I think, is 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 actually going to be a very important part of the, the next wave of mm. um, investment in Australia, which is actually making sure that these fantastic assets that, that China has controlling stakes in or very large stakes in um, are able act, you know, to, to move from you know, brownfields or greenfields into operating and producing assets. Mm. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that, Bryn. Um, and, and just before I ask um, Hans and uh, Amanda for their final thoughts on, on future um, prospects for opportunity, Bryn, if I can just ask, um, can I ask you to make a comment around agribusiness? I know agribusiness was kind of a, a, a major source of investment post chapter China Australia Free Trade Agreement around 2015. Um, how, how do you see the prospects of investment into agribusiness going forward? Um, actually, I, I probably should have touched on that one as well. Maybe it's my, um, it, you know, 
as a resources lawyer, I tend to focus on the resources side of things, but agribusiness is actually probably one that 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 does present a, a really good opportunity. Australia has obviously wanted to position itself as the food bowl of Asia. And so, um, you know, there there are opportunities um, to for, for investment in that, which are going to both satisfy Australia's policy objectives, um, you know, and, and and the role that it wants to play in the region, as well as as the um, uh, as well as an opportunity for for China to participate in that as well. And certainly in the in the northwest of Australia, there's been some very successful agri agri business investment by China, which which should you know demonstrate the sort of example of the way that these investments can be made mm. successfully. Mm. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Bryn. Um, Amanda, a, a, a final comment from you around um, uh, future prospects um, for Chinese investment into Australia? Look, I think Bryn has put it very, very well. Uh, you know, they, they, they're the key things. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Um, and Hans, the final word from you, um, just regarding um, anything you'd like to add around future prospects. Well, after, after we've covered the topics really very fully and very comprehensively and with a great level of expertise, I would like to, to, to bring in a, a consideration which, which hasn't been part of what we've been talking about. Um, and that is that, of course, apart from cooperation in Australia or Chinese investment in Australia, uh, there is always a possibility of cooperation in, in third countries, uh, which has been there for a long time considered sometimes realized but um i think it's it's coming up as a as a potentially interesting and and important area one one first example i think one could think of right now is to cooperate in the pacific uh where at the moment we are seeing ourselves in a very confrontational situation with china but if you look at the way in which australia is part of and partner of the Pacific that is not going to go away. And Australia has the best relations, whatever uh, you might think. That is an asset that the Chinese would be keen to exploit and that Australia probably might be keen to exploit in terms of being an infrastructure hub, a social hub, uh, a supporter for fisheries and, and the supervision that comes with that. Uh, so I think there are a number of areas where um, there is, there are really opportunities shaping up uh, because China is not going to go away. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, so there are opportunities shaping up that we could uh, look at beyond what is simply the investment here in Australia. Uh, go beyond in areas where it really does make sense. Okay, fantastic. Well, look on that on that very cogent point. I think we might wrap up the discussion today. Um, so my thanks to our um, speakers, um, uh, Professor Hans uh, Hendrischke from uh, the University of Sydney, um, Amanda Rasmussen from FTI, FTI Consulting, um, and Bryn Davis from uh, Minter Allison.